Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5. By John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 19. Halleck's Corinth Campaign On Wednesday, April 9th, two days after the Battle of Shiloh, General Grant gave evidence that he had fully learned the severe lesson of that terrible encounter. Reporting to Halleck his information that the enemy was again concentrating all his forces at Corinth, he added, I do not like to suggest, but it appears to me that it would be demoralizing upon our troops here to be forced to retire upon the opposite bank of the river, and unsafe to remain on this many weeks without large reinforcements. Halleck's opinion probably coincided with that of Grant, and the fortunes of war enabled him immediately to fulfill his promise to come to his relief. The day which saw the conclusion of the fight at Shiloh, April 7, 1862, witnessed the surrender of the rebel works at Island No. 10 on the Mississippi River and the quick capture of nearly their entire garrison of 6,000 or 7,000 men. This finished the task which General Pope had been sent to do, and enabled Halleck to transfer him and his army, by water, from the Mississippi River to the Tennessee. Halleck's order was made on April 15th, and on the 22nd Pope landed at Hamburg, four miles above the battlefield of Shiloh, with his compact force of 20,000 men fully organized and equipped, and flushed with a signal victory. Halleck had arrived before him. Reaching Pittsburgh Landing on the 11th of April, he began with industry to cure the disorders produced by the recent battle. Critics who still accuse the Lincoln administration of ignorant meddling with military affairs are invited to remember the language of the Secretary of War to Halleck on this occasion. I have no instructions to give you. Go ahead, and all success attend you. The arrival of Pope was utilized by Halleck to give his united command an easy and immediate organization into Army Corps. His special field orders of April 28th named the Army of the Tennessee the 1st Army Corps, commanded by Grant, and constituting the right wing, the Army of the Ohio the 2nd Army Corps, commanded by Buell, and constituting the center, and the newly arrived Army of the Mississippi the 3rd Army Corps, commanded by Pope, and forming the left wing. Two days later, April 30th, another order gave command of the right wing to General Thomas, whose division of the Army of the Ohio was added to it. It also organized a reserve corps under General McClernand, and had this provision. Major General Grant will retain the general command of the District of West Tennessee, including the Army Corps of the Tennessee, and reports will be made to him as heretofore. But in the present movements he will act as second in command under the Major General commanding the department. The exact intent of this assignment remains to this day a matter of doubt. Nominally, it advanced Grant in rank and authority. Practically, it deprived him of active and important duty. Halleck, being on the field in person, issued his orders directly to the Corps commanders and received reports from them, and for about two months Grant found himself without serious occupation. The position became so irksome that he several times asked to be relieved, but Halleck refused, though he finally allowed him to go for a season into a species of honorable retirement by removing his headquarters from the camp of the main army. Coming to the front so soon after the great battle, Halleck seems to have been impressed with the seriousness of the conflict, for all his preparations to assume the offensive were made with the most deliberate caution. It was manifest that the enemy intended to defend Corinth, and necessarily that place became his first objective. With all the efforts that the Confederate government could make, however, Beauregard succeeded in bringing together only about 50,000 effective troops. Halleck's combined armies contained more than double that number, but such was his fear of another surprise, or a sudden disaster, that his advance upon Corinth was not like an invading march, but like the investment of a fortress. An army carrying 100,000 bayonets, in the picturesque language of General Sherman, moved upon Corinth with pick and shovel. Entrenching, bridge-building, road-making were the order of the day. Former carelessness and temerity were succeeded by a fettering over-caution. The administration expected more energetic campaigning from a commander of Halleck's reputed skill and the brilliant results realized since his advent. 
the country seemed at the culmination of great events. Since the beginning of the year, success had smiled almost continuously upon the Union cause. As the crowning inspiration, in the midst of his march, there had come the joyful news of Farragut's triumph and the capture of New Orleans. Troops cannot be detached from here on the eve of a great battle, telegraphed Halleck to Stanton. We are now at the enemy's throat. To such encouraging assurances, the administration responded with every possible exertion of reinforcement and supply. But days succeeded days, and the president's hope remained deferred. Nearly a month later, when reports came that Halleck was awaiting the arrival of a fourth Union army, that of Curtis from Arkansas, and these reports were supplemented by intimations that he would like to be joined by a fifth army from somewhere else, Mr. Lincoln sent him a letter of such kindly explanation that, in the actual condition of things, every word was a stinging rebuke. Several dispatches from Assistant Secretary Scott and one from Governor Morton asking reinforcements for you have been received. I beg you to be assured we do the best we can. I mean to cast no blame when I tell you each of our commanders along our line from Richmond to Corinth supposes himself to be confronted by numbers superior to his own. Under this pressure we thin the line on the Upper Potomac. Until yesterday it was broken at heavy loss to us, and General Banks put in great peril, out of which he is not yet extricated and may be actually captured. We need men to repair this breach, and of them not at hand. My dear General, I feel justified to rely very much on you. I believe you and the brave officers and men with you can and will get the victory at Corinth. In reply, Halleck resorted to the usual expedient of reading the Secretary of War a military lecture. May 25th, he wrote, Permit me to remark that we are operating upon too many points. Richmond and Corinth are now the great strategical points of war, and our success at these points should be ensured at all hazards. His Herculean effort expended itself without corresponding result when, a week later, he marched into the empty entrenchments of Corinth, only to find that the 50,000 men composing Beauregard's army, the vital strength of rebellion in the West, were retreating at leisure to Baldwin and Okolona, railroad town some 50 miles to the south. It had required but two days for the rebel army to go from Corinth to the Shiloh battlefield. Halleck consumed 37 days to pass over the same distance and the same ground, with an army twice as strong as that of his adversary. Pope had reached him April 22nd, and it was the 29th of May when the Union army was within assaulting distance of the rebel entrenchments. The campaign had advanced with scientific precision and attained one object for which it was conducted. It gained the fortifications of Corinth. In the end, however, it proved to be but the shell of the expected victory. Beauregard had not only skillfully disputed the advance and deceived his antagonist, but at the critical moment had successfully withdrawn the rebel forces to wage more equal conflict on other fields. The enemy evacuated Corinth on the night of the 29th, and beyond the usual demoralization which attends such a retrograde movement, suffered little, for Halleck ordered only pursuit enough to drive him to a convenient distance. The achievement was the triumph of a strategist, not the success of a general. Instead of seizing his opportunity to win a great battle or to capture an army by siege, he had simply maneuvered the enemy out of position. In reporting his success to Washington, Halleck, of course, magnified its value to the utmost. And for the moment, the administration, not having that full information which afterwards so seriously diminished the estimate, accepted the report in good faith as a grand Union triumph. It was indeed a considerable measure of success. Besides its valuable moral effort in strengthening the patriotism and confidence of the North, and the secondary military advantage that the combined Western armies gained in the two months' strict camp discipline and active practical instruction in the art of field fortification, there was the positive possession of an important railroad center, and the apparent security of western and central Tennessee from rebel occupation. In addition to these, it had one yet more immediate and valuable military result. The remaining rebel strongholds on the upper Mississippi were now so completely turned that they were no longer tenable. Forts Pillow and Randolph were hastily evacuated by the enemy, and the Union flotilla took possession of their deserted works 
on June 5th. Halleck had been looking somewhat anxiously for help on the river, and had complained of the unwillingness of the gunboats to run past the Fort Pillow batteries and destroy the river fleet of the rebels. Flag Officer Davis had considered the risk too great and had remained above Fort Pillow, occupying his time and harassing the works by a continuous bombardment. Now that the way was opened, he immediately advanced in force, and at night of June 5th came to anchor two miles above the city of Memphis. His flotilla had lately received a notable reinforcement. One of the many energetic impulses which Stanton gave to military operations in the first few months after he became Secretary of War was his employment of an engineer of genius and daring, Charles Ellett, Jr., to extemporize a fleet of steam rams for service on the western rivers. The single blow by which the iron prow of the Merrimack sunk the Cumberland at the time of the famous sea fight between the Merrimack and the Monitor had demonstrated the effectiveness of this novelty in marine warfare. Ellett's proposal to the Secretary of the Navy to try it on the western rivers was not favorably entertained, probably because the Navy Department already had its officers and its appropriations engaged in other more methodical and permanent naval constructions. But the eager and impatient Secretary of War listened to Ellett's plans with interest, and commissioned him to collect such suitable river craft as he could find on the Ohio, and to convert them post-haste into steam rams. The Honorable Secretary, reports Ellett, expressing the hope that not more than twenty days would be consumed in getting them ready for service. Ellett received his orders March 27th. On May 25th, he joined the flotilla of Davis with a fleet of six vessels, formerly swift and strong river tugs and steamers, but now strengthened and converted for their new and peculiar service, and these accompanied the gunboats in the advance against Memphis. On the morning of June 6th, the rebel flotilla of eight gunboats was discovered in front of the city preparing for fight, and there occurred another of the many dramatic naval combats of the war. The eight rebel gunboats ranged themselves in two lines abreast the city. The hills of Memphis were covered with thousands of spectators. With the dawn, five of the Union gunboats began backing down the Mississippi, holding their heads against the strong current to ensure easier control and management of the vessels. The steam rams were yet tied up to the river bank. Soon the rebel flotilla opened fire on the Union gunboats, to which the latter replied with spirit. Four of Ellet's rams, hearing the guns, cast loose to take part in the conflict. One of them disabled her rudder, and another, mistaking her orders, remained out of the fighting distance. But the Queen of the West and the Monarch, passing swiftly between the gunboats, dashed into the rebel line. The gunboats, now turning their heads down the stream, hastily followed. There was a short and quick melee of these uncouth-looking river monsters, ram crashing into ram and gunboat firing into gunboat in a confusion of attack and destruction. In twenty minutes, four rebel vessels and one Union ram were sunk or disabled. At this, the other four rebel vessels turned and fled downstream, and in a running pursuit of an hour extending some ten miles, three additional vessels of the enemy were captured or destroyed. The Confederate fleet was almost annihilated. Only one of the gunboats escaped. The two disabled Union ships were soon raised and repaired, but the ram fleet had suffered an irreparable loss. Its commander, Ellet, was wounded by a pistol shot, from the effect of which he died two weeks later. The combat was witnessed by Jeff Thompson, commanding the city with a small detachment of rebel troops. In his report of the affair, he mentions that we were hurried in our retirement from Memphis. That afternoon, the Union flag floated over the city. The naval victory of Memphis supplemented and completed the great Tennessee campaign begun by Grant's reconnaissance of January 9th. A division of Buell's army under General Mitchell had in the meanwhile occupied and held the line of the Tennessee River between Tuscumbia and Stevenson, and thus the frontier of rebellion had been pushed down from Middle Kentucky below the southern boundary of the state of Tennessee. But the invading movement following the line of the Tennessee River had expended its advantage. The initial point of a new campaign had been reached. We are left in doubt under what conviction Halleck formed his next plans, for he determined to dissolve and scatter the magnificent army of more than 100,000 men under his hand and eye, apparently in violation of the very military theory he had formulated two weeks before when he said, We are operating on too many points. 
In a dispatch to the Secretary of War on the 9th of June, he announced his purpose to do three distinct things. First, to hold the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Second, to send relief to Curtis in Arkansas. Third, to send troops to East Tennessee. To these three, he added a fourth purpose in a dispatch of June 12th. If the combined fleet of Farragut and Davis fail to take Vicksburg, I will send an expedition for that purpose as soon as I can reinforce General Curtis. Up to this point, the country's estimate of General Halleck's military ability had steadily risen, but several serious errors of judgment now arrested his success. The greatest of these errors, perhaps, was the minor importance he seems to have attached to a continuation of the operations on the Mississippi River. We have described the victory of Farragut, and we need now to follow the upward course of his fleet. After receiving the surrender of New Orleans in the last days of April, he promptly pushed an advanced section of his ships up the Mississippi, which successfully and without serious opposition received the surrender of all the important cities below Vicksburg, where Farragut himself arrived on the 20th of May. Vicksburg proved to be the most defensible position on the Mississippi by reason of the high bluffs at and about the city. The Confederates had placed such faith in their defenses of the upper river at Columbus, Island No. 10, and Fort Pillow, that no early steps were taken to fortify Vicksburg. But when Farragut passed and captured the lower forts and the upper defenses fell, the rebels made what haste they could to create a formidable barrier to navigation at Vicksburg. Beauregard sent plans for fortifications while he was yet disputing Halleck's advance from Shiloh to Corinth, and Lovell at New Orleans, retreating before Farragut's invasion, shipped the heavy guns he could no longer keep, and sent five regiments of Confederate troops which he could no longer use to erect the works. These reached their destination on May 12th, and continuing the labors and preparations already begun, he had six batteries ready for service on Farragut's arrival. Remembering these dates and numbers, we can realize the unfortunate results of Halleck's dilatory Corinth campaign. He had then been in command, for a whole month, of forces double those of his antagonist. If, instead of digging his way from Shiloh to Corinth with pick and shovel, he had forced such a prompt march and battle as his overwhelming numbers gave him power to do, the inevitable defeat or retreat of his enemy would have enabled him to meet the advance of Farragut with an army detachment sufficient to effect the reduction of Vicksburg with only slight resistance and delay. Such a movement ought to have followed by all the rules of military and political logic. The opening of the Mississippi outranked every other Western military enterprise in importance and urgency. It would have effectively severed four great states from the rebel confederacy. It would have silenced doubt at home and extinguished smoldering intervention abroad. It would have starved the rebel armies and fed the cotton operatives of Europe. There would have been ample time, for he was advised as early as the 27th of April that New Orleans had been captured, and that Farragut had orders to push up to Memphis immediately, and he ought to have prepared to meet them. No such cooperation, however, greeted Farragut. Reaching Vicksburg, his demand for the surrender of the place was refused. The batteries were at such a height that his guns could have no effect against them. Only two regiments of land forces accompanied the fleet. There was nothing to be done but return to New Orleans, which he had reached about the 1st of June. Here he met orders from Washington communicating the great desire of the administration to have the river opened. Farragut took immediate measures to comply with this requirement. But his task had already become more difficult. The enemy quickly comprehended the advantage which the few high bluffs of the Mississippi afforded them, if not to obstruct, at least to harass and damage the operations of a fleet unsupported by land forces. The places which had been surrendered were, on the retirement of the ships, again occupied, and batteries were soon raised, which, though unable to cope with armed vessels, became troublesome and dangerous to transports, and were intermittently used or abandoned as the advantage or necessity of the enemy dictated. Farragut again reached Vicksburg about June 25th, accompanied this time by Porter with 16 of his mortar boats and by General Thomas Williams at the head of 3,000 Union troops. The mortar sloops were placed in position and bombarded the rebels' works on the 27th. On the morning of June 28th, before daylight, Farragut's ships, with the aid of the continued bombardment, made an attack on the Vicksburg batteries, and most of them succeeded in passing up the river with comparatively small loss. Here he found Ellet, a brother of him who was wounded at Memphis, with some vessels of the Ram fleet, 
who carried the news to the gunboat flotilla under Davis yet at Memphis. This flotilla now also descended the river and joined Farragut on the 1st of July. We have seen, by the dispatch heretofore quoted, that Halleck expected the combined naval and gunboat forces to reduce the Vicksburg defenses, but also that, in the event of their failure, he would send an army to help them. The lapse of two weeks served to modify this intention. The Secretary of War, who had probably received news of Farragut's first failure to pass the Vicksburg batteries, telegraphed him on June 23rd to examine the project of a canal to cut off Vicksburg, suggested by General Butler and others. Halleck replied on June 28th, It is impossible to send forces to Vicksburg at present, but I will give the matter very full attention as soon as circumstances will permit. That same day, Farragut passed above the batteries, and of this result Halleck was informed by Grant, who was at Memphis. Grant's dispatch added an erroneous item of news concerning the number of troops with Farragut, uh, but more trustworthy information soon reached Halleck in the form of a direct application from Farragut for help. To this appeal, Halleck again felt himself obliged to reply in the negative, June 3rd, 1862. The scattered and weakened condition of my forces renders it impossible for me at the present to detach any troops to cooperate with you on Vicksburg. Probably I shall be able to do so as soon as I can get my troops more concentrated. This may delay the clearing of the river, but its accomplishment will be certain in a few weeks. The hopeful promise with which the telegram closed dwindled away during the eleven days that followed. On the 14th of July, Stanton asked him the direct question. The Secretary of the Navy desires to know whether you have, or intend to have, any land force to cooperate in the operations at Vicksburg. Please inform me immediately, inasmuch as orders he intends to give will depend on your answer. The answer this time was short and conclusive. I cannot at present give Commodore Farragut any aid against Vicksburg. A cooperative land force of from 12,000 to 15,000 men, Farragut estimated in his report of June 28th, would have been sufficient to take the works. If we compare the great end to be attained with the smallness of the detachment thought necessary, there remains no reasonable explanation why Halleck should not have promptly sent it. But the chance had been lost. The waters of the Mississippi were falling so rapidly that Farragut dared not tarry in the river, and in accordance with orders received from the department on July 20th, he again ran past the Vicksburg batteries and returned to New Orleans. If Halleck's refusal to help Farragut take Vicksburg seems inexplicable, it is yet more difficult to understand the apparently sudden cessation of all his military activity, and his proposal, just at the time when his army had gathered its greatest strength and efficiency, to terminate his main campaign, and in effect, go into summer quarters. He no longer talked of splitting secession in Twain in one month, or of being at the enemy's throat. He no longer pointed out the waste of precious time, and uttered no further complaint about his inability to control Buell's army. His desires had been gratified. He commanded half of the military area within the Union. He had three armies under his own eye. The enemy was in flight before him. He could throw double numbers of men at any given point. At least two campaigns of overshadowing importance invited his resistless march. But in the midst of his success, in the plentitude of his power, with fortune thrusting opportunity upon him, he came to a sudden halt, folded his contented arms, and imitated the conduct that he wrongfully imputed to Grant after Donelson. Satisfied with his victory, he sits down and enjoys it without regard to the future. In a long letter to the Secretary of War, dated June 25th, after reviewing the sanitary condition of the Army and pronouncing it very good, he asked, apparently as the main question, Can we carry on any summer campaign without having a large portion of our men on the sick list? This idea seemed to dominate his thought and to decide his action. Buell had been ordered eastward on a leisurely march toward Chattanooga. Halleck proposed to plant the armies of Grant and of Pope on the healthy uplands of northern Mississippi and Alabama as mere corps of observation. Having personally wrested Corinth from the enemy, he exaggerated its strategic value. As a terminal point in the southward campaign along the line of the Tennessee River, its chief use was to aid in opening the Mississippi River by turning the Confederate fortifications from Columbus to Memphis. Those strongholds, once in federal possession, 
Corinth inevitably fell into a secondary role, especially since the summer droughts rendered the Tennessee River useless as a military highway. Carrying out this policy of Halleck, a large portion of the Western armies of the Union wasted time and strength guarding a great area of rebel territory unimportant for military uses, and which could have been better protected by an active forward movement. The security and the supply of Corinth appears to have been the central purpose. Buell was delayed in his march thoroughly to repair the railroad from Corinth eastward towards Chattanooga. Other detachments of the army were employed to repair the railroads westward from Corinth to Memphis, and northward from Corinth to Columbus. For several months, all the energies of the combined armies were diverted from their more useful duty of offensive war to tedious labor on these local railroads, much of the repairs being destroyed almost as rapidly as performed by daring guerrilla hostilities, engendered and screened amidst the surrounding sentiment of disloyalty. It is impossible to guess what Halleck's personal supervision in these tasks might have produced, for at this juncture came a culmination of events that transferred him to another field of duty. But the legacy of policy, plans, and orders that he left behind contributed to render the whole Western campaign sterile throughout the second half of 1862. The unfortunate policy of thus tying up the Western forces in mere defensive inaction comes out in still stronger light in the incident that follows, but it especially serves to show once more how, in the West as well as in the East, President Lincoln treated his military commanders, not with ignorant interference, as has been so often alleged, but with the most fatherly indulgence. Future chapters will describe the complete failure in the East of the campaign undertaken by McClellan against Richmond, and which, on the 30th of June, brought the Halleck an order from the Secretary of War, dated the 28th, immediately to detach and send 25,000 men to assist that imperiled enterprise. The necessity was declared imperative. But in detaching your force, explained the order, the president directs that it be done in such way as to enable you to hold your ground and not interfere with the movement against Chattanooga and East Tennessee. Halleck took instant measures to obey the order, but said in reply that it would jeopardize the ground gained in Tennessee and involved the necessity of abandoning Buell's East Tennessee expedition. This result the president had in advance declared inadmissible. He now telegraphed emphatically on June 30th, would be very glad of 25,000 infantry, no artillery or cavalry, but please do not send a man if it endangers any place you deem important to hold, or if it forces you to give up or weaken or delay the expedition against Chattanooga. To take and hold the railroad at or east of Cleveland in East Tennessee, I think fully as important as the taking and holding of Richmond. This request, but accompanied by the same caution and condition, was repeated by the President on July 2nd. And again, under the prompting of extreme need, Lincoln on July 4th sent a diminished request, still, however, insisting that no risk be incurred in the West. You do not know how much you would oblige us if, without abandoning any of your positions or plans, you could promptly send us even 10,000 infantry. Can you not? Some part of the Corinth army is certainly fighting McClellan in front of Richmond. Prisoners are in our hands from the late Corinth army. In Halleck's response on the following day, it is important to notice the difference in the opinions entertained by the two men upon this point. Lincoln wished to gain East Tennessee. Halleck desired to hold West Tennessee. The distinction is essential, for we shall see that while Halleck's policy prevailed, it tended largely, if not principally, to thwart the realization of Lincoln's earnest wish. Halleck telegraphed, For the last week there has been great uneasiness among Union men in Tennessee on account of the secret organizations of insurgents to cooperate in any attack of the enemy on our lines. Every commanding officer from Nashville to Memphis has asked for reinforcements. Under these circumstances, I submitted the question of sending troops to Richmond to the principal officers of my command. They are unanimous in the opinion that if this army is seriously diminished, the Chattanooga expedition must be revoked or the hope of holding southwest Tennessee abandoned. I must earnestly protest against surrendering what has cost us so much blood and treasure, and which in a military point of view, is worth three Richmonds. 
he had already, in a previous telegram, July 1st, acknowledged and exercised the discretion which Lincoln gave him, replying, Your telegram just received saves western Tennessee. It was found by the Washington authorities that the early reports of McClellan's reverses had been unduly exaggerated, and that by straining resources in the east the western armies might be left undiminished. But with this conviction, President Lincoln also reached the decision that the failure of the Richmond campaign must be remedied by radical measures. To devise new plans to elaborate and initiate new movements, he needed the help of the highest attainable professional skill. None seemed at the moment so available as that of Halleck. Under his administration, order had come out of chaos in Missouri. And under his guiding control, however feeble in the particular cases that we have pointed out, the Western armies had won the victories of Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, Pea Ridge, Shiloh, Island No. 10, and Corinth. It was a record of steady success, which justified the belief that a general had been found who might be entrusted with the direction of the war in its larger combinations. The weakness of his present plans had not yet been developed. Accordingly, on the 11th of July, this order was made by the President that Major General Henry W. Halleck be assigned to command the whole land forces of the United States as General-in-Chief, and that he repair to this capital as soon as he can with safety to the positions and operations within the department under his charge. It seemed at the moment the best that could be done. In his short Corinth campaign, Halleck had substantially demonstrated his unfitness for the leadership of an army in the field. He had made a grievous mistake in coming away from his department headquarters at St. Louis. He was a thinker and not a worker. His proper place was in the military study and not in the camp. No other soldier in active service equaled him in the technical and theoretical acquirements of his profession. The act of the president in bringing him to Washington restored him to his more natural duty. In following the further career of Halleck, one of the incidents attending this transfer needs to be borne in mind. The first intimation of the change came in the President's dispatch of the 2nd of July, which asked, Please tell me, could you make me a flying visit for consultation without endangering the service in your department? A few days later, one of the President's friends went from Washington to Corinth, bearing a letter of introduction to Halleck, explaining, among other things, I know the object of his visit to you. He has my cheerful consent to go, but not my direction. He wishes to get you and part of your force, one or both, to come here. You already know I should be exceedingly glad of this, if in your judgment it could be without endangering positions and operations in the Southwest. To this Halleck replied on July 10th, Governor Sprague is here. If I were to go to Washington, I could advise but one thing, to place all the forces in North Carolina, Virginia, and Washington under one head and hold that head responsible for the result. It is doubtful if Halleck measured fully the import of his language, or whether he realized the danger and burden of the responsibility which, if he did not invite, he at least thus voluntarily assumed. Nominally, he became General-in-Chief, but in actual practice his genius fell short of the high duties of that great station. While he rendered memorable service to the Union, his judgment and resolution sometimes quailed before the momentous requirements of his office, and thrust back upon the president the critical and decisive acts which overawed him. In reality, he was from the first only what he afterwards became by technical orders, the president's chief of staff. End of chapter. Recording by Mike Manalakis.